Uh, good morning and welcome to the Labour Force and Annual Population Survey Conference. Now move on to the main um, session in the conference. So um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, Nai Comanetti, um, who will share his screen shortly. So Nai works at the Resolution Foundation as a senior economist. Uh, the Resolution Foundation is an independent think tank that focuses really on living standards of low-income households. Um, they do a lot of research and they advocate um, quite effectively for policy change or policy adaptation. Uh, his particular focus is on the labour market and low paid work. So working on issues such as the minimum wage, the living wage, job quality and insecurity. And along with many of us, I suppose, working in research more recently, the impact of COVID-19 on um, that group of people who's been in the labour market that he's been interested in. So over to Nai for his presentation. Um, if you have questions, then post them in the Q&A on, the, um, on, the, on the website as we go through. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks very much, um, Nigel. Let me just quickly shut the door. Um, Hello across the office. Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to talk to you this morning. Um, I can see, so I'm joined by what looks like a collection of people from various universities. Uh, so hello, it's very nice to talk to you. Um, Nigel invited us to, to, to join your conference today. And my plan is to um, talk a bit about uh, a paper that I recently worked on, which is very much based on uh, the Labour survey as well as some other data. Um, but before I, I do that, I was going to talk a little bit about who we are as an organization and also a bit about um, a program of work called the Economy 2030 Inquiry, which, uh, which this work that I'm looking at now uh, sits within, so that's sort of the rough plan, it's going to be, who are we? Uh, what is this program of work that we're doing? And then I'll show you some, um, yeah, then I'll, then I'll take you through the work that I've been doing recently. So let me share my slides. Uh, hopefully this will work, share. Um, can, you, can you see that as a full screen or do I need to? Do anything different. That's full screen now. Okay, brilliant. All right, I'll crack on them. So, yes, uh, an introduction to RF highlights from our Economy 2030 program, and then a summary of this paper, Changing um, Jobs. Um, so, first of all, who are Resolution Foundation? I've, I've got no idea when I do these kinds of talks um, whether we have enough of a reputation that that sort of explaining who we are is 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 irritating because you because you know or or whether I need to, I should go into detail because you've never heard of us. It seems to vary, but I'll assume that you don't really have any sense of who we are. Um, so this is our this is the mission statement that you would find if you went onto our website, which is I think a useful place to start. So we're an independent think tank focused on improving the living standards of those on low to middle incomes, and we work across a wide range of economic and social policy areas, combining our core purpose with a commitment to rigor. Now, there's a lot of words in there, some of which sound uh, like, well, what do we really mean by those things? So just to quickly dwell on a couple of them. So by independent, that means we're not tied to any uh, political party. So obviously we talk to the Labour Party, we talk to the Conservative Party, but we're not tied to them, which is not quite the case for some other think tanks. And the benefit there is that we can talk to both. So whichever party is in power, we would hope to still be able to have some influence. Um, by living standards, we usually mean disposable income. That's sort of our, our standard way of thinking about that. But obviously, you could probably think about others as well. And the group that we're focused on is those on low to middle income. So um, the, the, reason, the reason for that, I think, is when we were set up, which is about 15 years ago now, there were a few uh, research organizations and charities focused on the, the very lowest uh, earners or those on the very lowest incomes. Um, but I think at the time, it felt like there was a, a gap um in in that sort of sl in uh for, for for that low to middle bracket and that those concepts like squeezed middle and just about managing sort of came out of some of that thinking um but i think in in a sort of day-to-day -day sense it's not like we would sort of 
throw, throw in the bin anything that didn't relate to deciles two to five or anything like that. So, you know, we don't sort of stick to that completely rigidly. Um, and then, yes, our purpose and, and our rigor are very important um, to us. Um, so who we are, we're about, um, I think I, we still consider ourselves fairly small, but we have been growing recently. There's about 30 of us who work here, of which tw about 20 are researchers. We were established in 2005. I've no idea if anyone is interested in the money side of things, but I was, uh, I find it interesting when you sort of get a sense of what it, what it costs to run an organization like us. It would cost about two million pounds a year to run. And the majority of our money comes uh, from a single trust. It's actually a single person who set up this trust a long time ago. That covers about two thirds of our costs. And then we do commission projects alongside it. That's sort of a very quick sense of who we are. Um, this is London. So if you're interested in geographically where we are, that's where I'm talking to you now. I'm actually in the office. Uh, so we're just just off uh, Birdcage Walk by St James's Park. This is a picture of our um, of our building, and actually, I am literally the other side of that window right there. That window over my shoulder is that one there. So there you go, uh, Nigel. When I spoke to you, I think you were interested in how we achieve our aims. So it's I suppose it's very well saying you want to improve work and improve the living standards of low income households. And it's very well saying we're going to do some research about how do those things you know connect with each other how does one relate to the other so first of all you know rigor i think is very important to us first of all obviously we want to draw you know we want to be correct in the things that we say uh, we want to you know come up with um, correct findings and so on um, but i think it's more than that because without rigor you you just don't get anywhere we, we often speak to journalists and you know and and they say to us you know the, the reason that we can uh, regularly get ourselves on the media or the reason that they will come to us you know if there's an emerging story relating to living standards or labor markets they'll often give us a call and um, because there's a certain amount of trust there and that basically comes from 15 years of building a reputation for caring a lot about rigor so it's, it's really really important to us and without it you basically don't get anywhere is our view. So that's sort of the bedrock on which everything else is based. Um, but in terms of impact, uh, I think we try and do that in, in two ways. I think you've probably got in your head this, this, this short-term version of impact, which might be, you know, a minister is trying to make a decision about something. You go for a meeting and you provide them with a sort of briefing note, which sets out a bit of research and your views. Uh, and that's definitely a way in which it's possible for a think tank to have impact. And we do that. So we'll definitely try to intervene at key moments when there are decisions being taken. Uh, most obviously, you know, twice a year, there's a budget and we would be putting out reports before the budget saying, you know, these are the key issues facing the groups that we care about. And here's what policy might do. Um, and we'll do, you know, reactions. But in particular, over the last year, there have been many more, uh, and, and during the crisis, I mean, there have been many more moments where there have been these sort of short-term moments where clearly the government is in a sort of decision-making frame of mind. And we've very much tried to influence those moments as well. So during the creation of the furlough scheme, we were sort of quite quick to put, put out papers. And when I say quick, I mean, uh, within a couple of days, papers saying, here's how we would design this kind of a scheme. And this would be, this is what the impact might be. Um, and then similarly at the moment, during um, what is set to be a cost of living crisis this year, driven by the rising energy prices, we are similarly putting out um, policy proposals, which some of which we hope might, might get taken up. So there are definitely short term ways in which um, a think tank like ours um, can achieve impact. Um, but probably the less obvious way, and but, but, but perhaps no less important, maybe more important, is this sort of long term um, effect that we try to have on the policy debate in terms of both which issues have some kind of profile uh, and the way in which they're, they're being discussed. So we sort of think of this as sort of a, a drumbeat of reports building the intellectual case for uh, caring about living standards uh, and for you know thinking about policy in the way that, that we do. And it's sort of hard to see that because you know you don't notice it day to day. Um, but I think, and I wasn't really, um, I've only sort of been in this world for the last 10 years. So I wasn't quite around at, 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 the, at the full outset of, of our organization. Um, but we yeah, it, but, but the, those that were say that, you know, living standards as an issue just had 
um, a much lower profile back then. Whereas nowadays, it would be impossible for you know an event like the budget or a big policy statement to happen without people asking about you know what what is the impact on living standards what is the impact on incomes of, of low earners those are just sort of default questions they got that get asked now and that wasn't necessarily the case um, when when we set up so that's how we think about impact uh, i know that nigel you're sort of potentially going to invite questions at the end, but I'm very happy to take interruptions at any point, especially because I've got a, a somewhat of a sort of a three part set of, of slides here. So if anyone has any questions at all about that, that, that first bit, I'd be very happy to take them. I, I can't see the, oh, there is a chat, so I might briefly look into the chat. I don't think there's any questions for me, but okay, I'll move on. But yeah, please do, please do interrupt and, and raise your hand and, and whatever you feel like if, if, if you have any questions at all. So moving on then, um, we have, uh, we six months ago launched a program of work called the Economy 2030 Inquiry, which sort of does what it says on the tin. It's about where we think the economy is headed um, over, over the coming um, decade. Um, we are doing this, it's a, it's a collaboration. So it's all funded by Nuffield. So if there's anyone here from Nuffield, uh, thank you very much. Um, and it's a collaboration between us and the Centre for Economic Performance at the London School of Economics. And so far, I think there's been about 15 researchers there, about, about that, maybe 10 or 15 that have been involved with uh, this programme of work. And, and on our side, like I said earlier, there's 20 researchers. So we're covering quite a broad range of topics, which I'll go through in a moment. And we, what we do is we sort of you know, bring in the different researchers um, as, as, and, as and when. Um, we want to. Um, so why are we doing this inquiry? So our argument is um, that the 2020s are going to be a very important decade for the uh, for the UK economy and by extension for uh, living standards for low income households, the group that we care about. So it's not just that this is the post pandemic period where we will sort of, to some extent see life returning to normal, uh, but we'll also be faced by the lingering effects of COVID. Um, it's also going to be the period where the economy adjusts to Brexit. Obviously, some, some of those adjustments have been happening already and are happening now, but we think those are going to continue over the next decade. Um, and it's also the decade where much of the work in terms of transitioning to net zero has to take place. So we think those three things are what we would consider shocks facing the economy. And our argument is... That there hasn't been anything of quite that scale happening at the same time in the UK economy for about a generation. Uh, and I'll sort of come on to that a bit when I talk about my um, jobs report at the end. Uh, and on top of those shocks, there are the ongoing, you can either call them shocks or you know, trends in the shape of demographic change uh, and technology. And obviously both of those things will continue to drive change in this decade as well. So our argument is this is an absolutely crucial decade and it could go badly or well, depending on the decisions that are taken. Uh, and the reason therefore that we're putting all this evidence together is to say, well, how can we best navigate this decade in a way that you know doesn't damage prosperity and maybe even uh, promotes prosperity, again, in particular for low income households. Yeah, so there you go. Those are the five drivers of change that I was just talking about, which we think will have a big uh, impact in this decade. Um, just to uh, show you a couple of images relating to those, I don't think you know any of this will be news to you, but it's the kind of stuff that we're trying to bring into one place. So this is just the idea. This is the internet sales as a percentage of total retail sales. And you can see it's been growing over time, but it really shot up during the pandemic. And we think that, you know, so to some extent, COVID is going to um, uh, speed up or, or, or put boosters underneath pre-existing trends. Um, this could be, you know, uh, the, the 1980s is, is the decade we usually point to as the, as the last time there was significant change happening. And again, I'll talk about this in more detail in a second. And the interesting thing about it is I think many people will have ideas of, uh, you know, the real uh, difficulties that that created in, in some areas. Uh, and that's certainly true. And that's the next slide. But what is not often remembered is actually it was a period of quite fast rising income. So it's interesting that you can have those two things happening at the same time. Um, but yes, this was the downside of the change that took place 
uh, in the 1980s. This is the fall in employment um, as measured in the census from 1981 to 1991 in, in a selection of local authorities. And I think it's just it always makes me boggle looking at this chart, this sort of scale of the change in in, 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 in um, the number of jobs that took place in some of these areas. I mean, a fall of a third is an absolutely uh, incredible change uh, during that decade. So yes, alongside general rising incomes was obviously real pain in some parts of the country. Uh, alongside that, this is a chart just trying to bring home the Brexit point. So obviously, I think you would have probably seen charts like this in the news. Um, but although trade uh, to non-EU has been recovering, was recovering last year, uh, trade to EU was much slower to recover. So uh, although it's hard to you know, pick out Brexit from the impact of COVID, it does, you know, the, I think this chart makes the point fairly clearly that there definitely is going to be an impact. And, and, um, and that will continue. And we've, you know, as I'll show in a moment, have started trying to think through what the impacts of that will be. Um, uh, yep. And then finally, like I said, this will be the decade where uh, the big net zero transition should happen, or, or a large part of it anyway. Um, obviously, whether or not it does is, is, is somewhat of an open question. Uh, but this is just trying to bring home the sort of scale of um, capital and investment costs uh, alongside the savings, uh, which will be required for us to get there. Uh, and this is just taken from the uh, Climate Change Committee. And then finally, why does it all matter? Well, the argument in our launch report was that, um, you know, the uh, country's economic positions can change and quite fast. So you might think, it might be tempting to think that all of these things, well, you know, yes, they're shocked, but, you know, by and large, the economy will just bump along and it will adjust and everything will be fine. Um, but we've used this image, which is just comparing us to uh, three other European countries to show that people, uh, the country's economic positions can change quite quickly. And we think that, you know, the policy decisions that are taken are obviously a big part of that. And the example that made the, um, that people talked a lot about when we showed them this graph was Italy um, and the difference between uh, GDP per capita there um, just before the financial crisis and now. So Italy went from being at the top of this group to down towards the bottom with Spain. And the UK has also obviously fallen behind relative to Germany in that period as well. Okay, so that's that's sort of the, in a nutshell why we decided to launch this program of work. Uh, we started it in the summer. It's a two year bit, uh, program of work um, and we have been busy. So this was our launch report. Uh, but we've since also now written reports on on what we on um, on workers' experiences of work. Uh, we've written a report about the carbon crunch. Uh, this was a report about trading regimes and how they um, and, and their impact in the UK economy. This was on the performance of the UK's businesses with a sort of focus on productivity. This was on the impact of the COVID crisis, where we focused a lot on the rise in economic inactivity and suggested that you know, that was likely to be a lasting legacy of the crisis. And so far, that looks like that, that is the case. In the latest, latest labor market stats, you can see that inactivity was still um, heading upwards. Um, this was a very long look at trends in the history of welfare in this country, the different groups it has favored. Um, you know, where we showed, for example, uh, the really significant falls in replacement rates of people um, uh, losing work and um, having recourse to, to social security payments. And this, I'm putting this one in here because of just the excellent pun in the title, but this was by my colleague Sophie, and it was about the, um, this one came out yesterday, and it was about the prospects for a trade deal with India and what impact uh, that might have. Um, so those are all reports that we've done in the last couple of months. Uh, in addition, we've done a, a few um, briefing notes. Um, on top of those was this one. So this was a report that came out in January, um, which I co-authored with um, colleagues at the LSE. And so that um, in, is about the history of economic change in the labour market and workers' experiences of those change. So that is what I was going to talk to you about in the final part of this presentation. But again, I'll just do a quick pause in case anyone has anything they wanted to ask or shout about in, in those slides I just shared. And absolutely fine if they're not, if, if you don't, of course.
All right, moving on then. So um, again, the premise of, of our whole economic economy 2030 inquiry is that this will be a decade where a, a lot of change happens and it's important that policy makers take the right decisions and manage that change well. Uh, and we will be building you know, a full set of policy proposals around that in, our, in the second year of our inquiry. Uh, but this first year is more about looking backwards and trying to understand um, how uh, change has happened in the past or, and, and trying to understand what's happening now as well. So this report was focused on how change in the labour market has happened in the past and what workers' experiences of those were. So to do that, um, we set up a bit of a straw man argument relating to economic change, which is that uh, I think in many people's minds, the pace of change uh, is speeding up. So you might see headlines of, you know, robots taking our jobs or reports of exciting new technologies. And, you know, it might feel like this sort of world of work, change in the world of work um, is speeding up. And that's maybe an idea that many people have, but you can tell me if that's not the case. Um, and secondly, although I'm sure many would agree that structural change has positives, I think many would think that it mainly involves, um, it, it happens mainly through people losing their jobs in declining sectors, obviously relating to that story I showed you earlier of those parts of the country that really, that experienced really significant job loss in the 80s. So our report is sort of testing the extent to which these two ideas are true. And there are definitely um, uh, some aspects um, of, of, of them that are true, but I think they also need to be um, challenged a bit as well so that we can have a sort of a, a fully rounded understanding of how change has tended to happen in the past. And yeah, our suggestion is that that might give us a better sense of, of what's going to be coming uh, in this decade. So first of all, um, first of all, this idea that change has sped up and I should clarify that here, um, I'm not trying to capture every uh, type of change, you know, every, every way in which economic life is changing. But in particular, we're focusing on the extent to which uh, labour is reallocating across different sectors of the economy. So, you know, manufacturing services and so on. Um, we will definitely and have done in the past written reports about, you know, changes in job security, contract type, people's experience of work, that's we're in no way discounting that, but I just want to clarify that this report is about change in the kinds of jobs that we're doing as described by um, occupations and sectors. So the, the brief answer to, the, to the, the question of is change speeding up is perhaps surprisingly uh, no. Um, so this is here presenting you a measure of the rate at which taking a decade on decade view. So looking at the structure of uh, the economy now to 10 years ago and doing that all the way back uh, throughout the century. It's a measure of how different is the sectoral composition um, at those two points in time. Um, and the reason there are two lines on this chart is that we use two different um, aggregations of, of, of economic sectors. Uh, and that's just to do with the data that is available over different time periods. So you can get a very long term series of um, employment by uh, 11 sections that comes from the Bank of England's millennium of macroeconomic data. Um, but if you want a slightly more detailed look, that data only goes back to the um, 1970s. Um, but interestingly, they, they basically tell exactly the same story, which is that change has been uh, the rate of change in terms of the the composition of late, the sectoral composition of, of, of work has been basically slowing down since the mid 1980s. It did pick up around the time of the financial crisis, but then the trend of uh, a slowing pace of change continued after that. And I think that's potentially surprising to some people. Like I said, you might have this sense that change is speeding up, um, but it doesn't look like that is really the case. There's not really enough data yet to plot the impact of COVID on this chart. I mean, it looks like it might be you know, in a tiny sense, picking up, but it's, it's not really something you'd be able to measure this long, long term view. Um, but yes, uh, aside from the 80s, and I'll focus on that in a second, uh, the other periods where we observe fast rates of change have been around the um, around the wars. So you can see after the Second World War there, uh, the composition of work was very different to, 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 to what it was 10 years before that. Um, 
So what was it that was happening in the 80s that was leading to such a, a, uh, a high rate of change? Well, I think, as you'll probably all know, it was the transformation from uh, manufacturing to a range of services. Uh, and basically that was happening at a much faster rate in that period than it was now. It's still happening. You can see on this, this graph here, and this is the um, proportion of jobs in a selection of sectors um so yeah the proportion of jobs represented by a selection of sectors you've got manufacturing down the bottom there and you've got a number of um services um in green there two of which are um public sector or mainly public sector services so education health but we've also got professional services you could add to this picture um a number of other personal services like hospitality um but the data doesn't go quite as far back as it's not quite as easily manipulable so but this but i think even with these services here you can tell a fairly clear story of you know man manufacturing employment was actually pretty stable from the 50s to the 70s and even if you go back to earlier in the century you know the proportion of jobs in manufacturing didn't really change for the first half of the um, 20th century but then in the 70s and 80s we just saw this really you know rapid fall in man in, in manufacturing share of employment um driven you know by uh, you know technological changes uh, the, you know globalization and so on and in its place uh, came jobs and services so basically in the 80s we had this really fast rate of transformation and those forces to a large extent ha are still happening but a lot of them have you know run out of steam so although change is still happening as i showed you in that previous chart it's just happening at a much slower pace nowadays so that's the response to point 1 and um, a second, um, um, yeah, the, the second idea that I think many people have is that structural change like this mainly happens through individual workers losing their jobs, being made redundant. So, you know, manufacturing facility somewhere closes down and people lose their jobs and then individual workers need to look for, you know, work in another sector or perhaps, you know, remain unemployed or, or inactive as many did in the, in the 1980s. And I'm certainly not here arguing that that doesn't happen. Clearly it does. In any crisis, you can observe rates of redundancy rising. Um, but I first want to just argue that that's not the only way in which these kinds of structural changes happen. So reallocation of labor across sectors can come from a number of sources. Workers can individually move jobs between sectors, and that does happen. Um, but you can also have reallocation from the net effect at the sector level of workers joining and leaving the workforce. And in the report, we split that into a natural entry and exit, which we think about as the difference between younger workers joining the workforce and older workers leaving it. So you might have a stylized picture in your head of younger workers nowadays more likely to be joining services and older workers, perhaps in manufacturing, uh, leaving. And so that effect even if no individual work actually makes the move from those sectors can lead to quite significant amounts of sectoral reallocation. Uh, and then you can also have that effect going on, but within career. So people, people obviously move in and out of, of, of the labor market. Um, and I think this is the first time I've seen someone try to pick apart those, those different types of reallocation. And we did, and we did this using the annual survey of, of hours and earnings. And it's, and it's far from a, perfect data set to be doing this we have to rely on the panel component here and we're uh, and i'll explain how we, how we did that and it, it's not perfect but uh, i haven't seen you know an attempt at measuring this elsewhere and interestingly what it shows is that so this is manufacturing which obviously as we've just looked just seen was falling in employment in this period um but work is directly moving between sectors is in the red bars there and that does contribute to falling employment in manufacturing so some workers you know leaving manufacturing to other sectors but actually it's 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 the one of the smaller uh, factors driving reallocation the bigger factor in the 80s and 90s anyway um was um what we call in the report natural entry and exit so as i said the difference between younger workers joining the labor force and, and older workers leaving it which i think is quite interesting because it suggests that you can have really significant rates of change which, which doesn't entirely rest on individual workers experiencing uh, that change. So that for me was quite interesting. And another, another way of showing the same point uh, of this natural entry and exit effect is to look at the changing 
um, age profile of the manufacturing workforce. So this is the difference in employment by age um, over a 25 year period. We can't, in this data, this is the, looking at the LFS now, we can't go all the way back to, um, well, you can in some, in some annual files, but in, in, the, in the data we had ready access to, um, I think it, it sort of starts here in the, in the early 90s. And so this is a 25 year period. And it's just showing that the fall in manufacturing employment has been concentrated among those of, of among lower age groups. But by contrast, business services, a sector which grew strongly in this period has seen you know, jobs growth uh, across the age range. Um, yeah. Okay, so what should we make of, um, of, of, of economic change? Well, here again, just referring back to that straw man, the idea that it's, um, you know, you know, maybe has some good aspects, but it is really negative for individuals. I think that basically is true, but it misses the fact that it is also positive for some individuals. Is the key is the sort of key addition we wanted to make to that straw man. And so, on on that individual level, what we can do in an Ash data set is again using its panel components is, is look at the the uh, typical individual level pay growth of individuals who are moving jobs. And I think you, you may have seen a series like this, the ONS publishes one going back to, uh, I can't remember, I think it's the last 20 years or so, but we've stretched that back to the early seventies. And what you can see is that there basically has always been this movers bonus. So individuals who move jobs in, in a year, uh, on average, this is the, sorry, the, the, their median annual pay growth compared to the previous year, is 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 always higher than the median pay growth of people who stay in their jobs. I don't think that's very surprising. But what I found interesting here is that the difference between those two, so the movers bonus, which is the which I'm showing in the in the yellow area, shaded area there, that has been a pretty consistent feature of economic life going back to the 70s. And it does rise and fall somewhat. It tends to uh, fall a bit during periods of of economic. Crisis. So you can see in the early 90s, it falls and again in the financial crisis. But it's been, but it sort of, so but it hovers around a, a, a trend of, of about four percentage points throughout that um, 40 year uh, period, which I, I thought was quite interesting. So this movers bonus idea that individual individual workers can benefit from, from change um, has been a consistent, um, something we consistently observe. Um, and that is particularly the case if workers don't just change jobs, um, but change jobs to a different sector or to a different region. And this is the average, this is using the, the modern national, and this is the average individual level pay growth over the last 15 years um, for workers who make these different types of moves. Obviously, there's two ways of thinking about this. You could say that, well, you know, it's, it's workers sort of seizing the opportunity of change, or you could say, you know, it requires uh, uh, you know, a, a more significant pay boost like this for workers to justify the upheaval that comes with um, these kind of moves. Um, but I think either way, it adds to the idea that, you know, change is not a wholly bad thing for workers at the individual level. Um, and yeah, this, this it just, just to add to that, we, we just had this um, look at this concept of uh, occupational uh, polarization, which I think many would have heard of. And we just argued briefly in the report that um, economic change over the last 20 years has actually more been characterized by occupational upgrading than it has by uh, polarization. So this is the um, growth in employment by the decile of occupation at the start of the period. And we're looking at the last 20 years. And you can see that, so polarization is, usually means growth at, growth with lower paying jobs, growth of high paying jobs and the fall in the middle. And there has been a fall of, low, of middle paying jobs and a growth of higher paying jobs. But we don't really observe much growth in, in the lower end. So we have described this as more a story of upgrading rather than one of, of polarization. And that's particularly true of women, which you can see with the uh, blue dots there compared to men. OK, so there are definitely some positives when it comes to economic change, even for individual workers. It's not just an aggregate effect. Um, but we certainly don't in the report discount the real risks that do come for, for some workers. Uh, and the main risk, uh, unsurprisingly, is of workers losing their jobs being made redundant. So here I'm showing you for the uh, two quarter LFS, the proportion of workers who um, in the last quarter were made redundant. So facing an in involuntary job loss 
um, but we're splitting it up in the other two lines between workers in declining and in expanding um, expanding sectors. And our argument in the report is that basically those earlier periods were characterized by faster rates of change. And as change as the rate of change across sectors has slowed down, it looks like, and we can't really prove this, you know, in a in in a, we got, yeah, we definitely can't. We're definitely not aiming to prove a causal relationship relationship but what we what we suggest anyway or i suppose speculate is that the slowing rate of change has meant fewer workers being pushed out of their jobs and it, that's interesting because you can particularly see that happening in declining industries um you know there's just been much slower rates of involuntary job loss in those sectors than there was uh, 20 years ago and unfortunately this is as far back as we could uh, stretch this series why does that matter um well as i'm sure won't come as a surprise, involuntary job loss is just a profoundly uh, negative experience. Obviously, it is in the immediate sense, no one likes losing their job, but it also has negative uh, knock-on effects. So here I'm showing you um, in the five-quarter five quarter LFS, the median um, pay growth people experience um, compared to the previous year. So this is only looking at people obviously in work today and who were in work a year ago. Uh, and overall, that tends to come out at about 2%, uh, controlling for inflation. Um, but there's a really massive difference between um, um, and between whether a worker in, in, that, in, in that intervening period experienced some uh, time out of work involuntarily. So in the blue, you can see that if we only look at people who, who had a period out of work, but for whom that 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 period not working was voluntary, i.e. they quit their job and we had in the LFS observed them not working in a particular quarter. By the time they're back in work, their, their typical pay growth is you know, almost exactly in line with, with the overall figure on, on the left-hand side there. But when we look at individuals who had an involuntary period out of work within the past year, uh, they have uh, negative pay growth. So it's not just that workers lose their jobs and then you know, have the, the pain of some time in unemployment uh, so when they do return to work, they typically earn less uh, than they did in their previous job. So involuntary job lists are bad now uh, and in the future. And we also show in the report that uh, involuntary job loss job losses are associated with longer periods out of work. So it takes people uh, slightly longer to return to work than if they quit their job uh, voluntarily. Um, just looking at the time, I think I think I've just about got time to do this, and I wanted to show you these slides because. I think I'm speaking to, um, uh, well, I know I'm speaking to L LFS users, so I thought this might be interesting to you. So in the report, we had a, a deeper look at, at job moves um, and uh, it, it didn't necessarily make the sort of headlines in the, in the report, but I, th I think the, the work was, was quite interesting. Um, so first of all, we showed that the rate at which workers move jobs and move sectors, so job moves to a different sector are here shown in the dark blue bars and within sector job moves are shown in the light blue bars and the totality of those bars is, is, is any job move. And we showed that that you know the rates at which workers are moving jobs really vary very significantly across different groups of workers. So there's you know really significant variation by age group, um, which I think probably wouldn't be a surprise uh, by contract type. So again, temporary workers much more likely to move jobs than those in permanent contracts. Um, but there are also big variations in the in you know by occupation groups. So those in lower paying occupations move jobs at a much faster rate, um, as do those in certain sectors. So um, uh, hospitality uh, and retail associated with much higher rates of job move than those in uh, public administration. So that was quite interesting. Um, and you know, one question you might have is, well, job moves have been slowing. I haven't actually shown you. That, that chart in this presentation, but the rate at which on average across the economy workers move jobs has been slowing our, over the last um, 20 or 30 years. And we have some measures going back a bit further than that, but it, lo it looks like much of that change has been happening over the last 20 or 30 years. To you know, and, and there is some extent to which compositional factors are driving that. So we know that the workforce is aging, and I've just showed you that older workers are much less likely than younger workers to move jobs. But inter interestingly, you know, compositional factors are contributing to slowing mobility, um, 
that only explain about the quarter of the fall in job mobility that we observe over the last 20 years. So you know, they're, they're having an effect, but it's not really the main story. Which, and this is why uh, we suggest that that structural impact, so the rate at which the economy is changing, uh, may be the bigger factor than the um, uh, changing composition of, of, of the workforce. The other thing I wanted to show you, and this was work that was done by my colleagues at LSE, um, was um, trying to not just measure whether workers are changing jobs and whether they're changing jobs to different sectors, but, 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 in, but in a slightly more nuanced way, trying to understand how the trying to understand the nature of those um, job moves. So we can measure in this method I'll show you now, not just uh, whether someone's moving jobs, but the distance uh, of the job move that they've made and to some extent also the direction of their move. Um, and we do that using the ONS's ONET database, which breaks down occupations into a set of tasks, which you may have come across this classification before. So it's non-routine, analytical, personal, and physical, and routine, cognitive, and manual. So there's this sort of five task types and every occupation is given um, an importance waiting for these different sets of tasks. And, oh, a raised hand. I'm very happy to take an intervention. Please do speak up. I, I couldn't quite see who it was, but. Sorry, no, I, um, I, was, I, um, I was trying to open the chat. Um, I clicked on the wrong button because I'm a Okay. So All right, no worries, no worries. Um, so yes, we can, we can build this classification of task type for different occupations, and then we can measure how uh, different how different two jobs are in terms of the different makeup of the of of their constituent um, tasks. Um, it's a technique that has been used before, uh, but you don't see it used quite so much in the UK because you have to do this mapping of the USA's um, ONET database onto UK occupations, which you know definitely definitely can be done. Uh, but I suppose it's an extra step. So you do tend to see a bit more in the US um, literature. And so this then allows you to build this sort of typology of the distance between at which workers are, are, are moving when they're moving jobs in, in terms of the task requirements involved in the jobs they're moving between. So this is just trying to show you that distribution. So over on the left, so this is all, all, all workers changing jobs. And you can see over on the left there, about a third of workers, when they change jobs, move to a job within the same occupation um, but over on the right hand side in the red bars you've got all the workers who moved to a job in a different occupation and you can see the spread of the distances which they're moving and so interestingly I, I if you if I, before I'd seen this chart I, I would probably have expected to look more like you know a, a consistent downward slope so workers being more likely to move to the jobs that more closely resemble their, their current job and sort of tailing away as work as work as jobs get more distant so um, but that's not what we observe. So actually, it's more common for workers to move to this sort of medium distance, to make this medium distance job move than it is for them to make a really near job move. Um, and the numbers um, here are, you know, a statistical contract that construct that relate to the sort of standard deviation of the difference in this measure of similarity that, that we construct. But just to give you a slightly more concrete meaning of those numbers. So a job distance move of two, which is the most common we observe, is equivalent to a nurse moving to a job uh, in a factory. And this is not, and, and, and we don't mean that in a sort of a positive or a negative way, just literally in terms of the distance between those two types of, of, of the tasks involved in those jobs. Um, a distance of one um, would be equivalent to a nurse becoming a care worker or a care worker becoming a nurse. You can probably imagine those jobs are much more similar in, in terms of the tasks they require. And then larger distances, for example, a nurse moving to become a solicitor, that would be a job move of three. And it's quite interesting to observe that you do still, be, you know, in that, in that quite distant job move, um, observe, you know, a good, a good number of job moves. But yeah, this was interesting to me. And I, I'd be curious to know if you've seen this kind of result for, for the UK before. So just to bring out a couple of other results that, that then flow from that. So first of all, just looking at age. So I, I showed you already that workers who are older are less likely to move jobs. Um, they're also, um, it's, it's also the case that, that older workers are less likely to move jobs to a different occupation. And again, that's probably not surprising. You know, younger workers are still building their careers. You know, they might be moving, you know, 
they haven't quite figured out yet, you know, what, what job they want to end up in. Um, so, so I think that's not surprising. So you can see this is the red bar, the red line there. This is the proportion of job moves that are to a, a different occupation that's higher for younger workers and that falls with age. But if you if you look at the workers who did move occupation, which is the blue bar, uh, the blue line, uh, which then measures the distance that they've moved, there's not a straightforward relationship with age, and it might not be the one that you would have expected. So actually the the, the biggest distance that workers are moving um, is actually highest for the very oldest workers we observed, uh, which was quite an, uh, a surprising finding. So again, I would probably have expected that blue bar to look more like the red, the blue, blue line to look like the red line, i.e. as workers get older, they're less likely to make big job moves in terms of the distance, but that's, that's not what we observe. I thought that was quite interesting. And then the other finding to draw out is that you don't, you, 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 we, we, we're not just limited to measuring the distance between jobs, but we can also look at the direction that they're moving in terms of whether they're moving towards or away from these different um, component tasks. And what we observe is that there's quite a big difference between workers who've made an involuntary exit from their previous job to workers whose job move was voluntary. So people making voluntary job moves are likely to move towards non-routine cognitive analytical um, jobs or jobs involving high uh, amounts of, of of that kind of task and that is associated with with higher pay so it looks like people making voluntary moves it's usually a positive thing but on the on, on the on the other hand people making involuntary moves either they move jobs but their previous job exit was was you know a, a redundancy they're more likely to move towards um sorry away from from non-routine uh, cognitive analytical jobs and non-routine personal jobs and towards uh, routine jobs which which typically uh, are associated with lower rates of pay so so it's again it's just another way of showing that those previous episodes in our economy of high rates of involuntary job move um it's it's yeah it's another way of showing that those things are, are negative experiences for the works involved and then finally just to briefly draw out lessons for the 2020s um I've, I've probably said enough about the understanding of economic change but just to say that it's Recently, there hasn't been very much of it. You know, the composition of our economy in terms of sectors now is, is broadly similar to what it was 10 years ago, but that definitely wasn't the case in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there are winners as well as losers from change, and it's not the case that sectoral adjustment mainly relies on workers losing their jobs. Actually, natural uh, change flows in and out can explain quite a, a large part of sectoral change. And then for policymakers, this really is a sort of a tentative first go at policy because we'll be doing more detailed policy reports, but we think that they should prepare for more change in the 2020s than we are, than we are used to. So that means sort of gearing up our uh, skills, services, our um, you know, employment services to be ready for that. And then we think in terms of mitigating or, or managing that change is about maximising the benefits, which, which we think will mean helping workers make pay enhancing moves to growing sectors. Um, and worrying about the involuntary job losses, which will, we think, probably pick up as, as rates of change um, increase. Okay, I think that was all from me. Thank you very much for bearing with me.